I want us to look in the scriptures, and we're going to see the story from the past that's going to speak powerfully to the present. And one of the things I want you to do, even as we walk through the story of the Church of Philippi in Acts tonight, that I want you to be thinking about things that God's done in your life. I want you to be like bringing to memory like powerful moments that you've experienced with your youth groups or when you came to faith in Christ or maybe you're going to be able to remember like some special conversations that you've had with your youth pastor or an adult leader. You're going to remember like awkward moments that happen in kind of every youth group because let's be real, there's just a lot of awkward in the room, you know, and so I, like I want you to be remembering those things because here's the honest truth, right? I mean, here's like a powerful thought. God is always remembering us, right? We know that Christ sustains the world by the power of his word, and he holds us in his hand. And if he ever ceased to think about you, like if you were not on his active mind, right? Like we have things subconsciously that sometimes come up to the surface, you know, like the time that you came home from soccer practice and jumped into the pool with white shorts on, not aware of the consequences like, there are things like that that kind of bubble up. Don't, I didn't even prepare that. It just came to the right then. I don't, you know what I mean? Like, that happens. And there are things that we actively try to remember, like our wedding date. And if you're not good with dates, those things just are important for you to keep on your active memory. Or you start an eye note with those details. But God, if he ever ceased to actively think of you, you would, you would not exist. Right? So no matter what else is happening in your life this evening, Here's one thing that you can be encouraged by, that God is remembering you even now, or especially now. If there are things in your life happening that you're thankful for or celebrating, then, and here's an example of what the Bible does with this idea of memory and why it's going to be important tonight, right? Look at Psalm 137, just by way of introduction here. This is a, a song as Israel has kind of been, it's kind of a, a terrible context, actually, Israel has been deported to Babylon, right? They have come in, that is the Babylonians, and they've ransacked Jerusalem. I mean, it got awful for the people of Jerusalem as they tried to withstand the siege, as the place where God caused his name to dwell was taken by foreigners. Israel is left just to, like, pick up the pieces of their scattered lives and broken homes, wondering, like, how God could let a faithless people like, take the faithless people. You know what I mean? Like, he had given them this land and displaced other peoples, but now they're the displaced ones. And, the, and they write this psalm in the midst of that, and this is what it says, Psalm 137. You can just listen, right? Just take this in. By the waters of Babylon, the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and wept. The memory of what's happened, the trauma of that experience just like overcomes the people. And they sit down and they wept when they remembered Zion. On the willows, the trees there, they hung up their lyres. And from there, our captors required of us songs. They mocked the people of Israel. This is what they said. With mirth, they said to us, sing us one of those songs of Zion. Sing us a song about the proud city of God kind of catch the sarcasm, the cold-bloodedness of that, right? So this is what they say, though. I mean, think about this posture of prayer. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? How can we sing about a God who sustains and provides when he has done neither? How can we pray to a God who said he will be Emmanuel with us, but he seems to be, like, nowhere to be found? Maybe you're here wondering that this evening, and this is what they say, if I forget you, Jerusalem, city of God, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. If I do not remember you, Jerusalem, if I do not set you above my highest joy. And then this is what they pray. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem. So they ask God to do the same thing. So isn't it interesting that that we would be commanded to do something that God is also doing? What does that mean for us this morning or this evening? A few things. We can remember something because it's powerful for our past. 
it can also make memory an active thing. In other words, you can draw to mind something from your past to shape your present or future. So this weekend, I want us to be doing this thing the whole weekend, right? We're going to be calling to mind memories. I'll share some with you. Some will be like ridiculous. Some will be like heartwarming and sincere, which I rarely am, you know, like I'm growing in that. But I want you to be doing the same thing together. I want you to be calling to mind trips that you've taken together or things that your pastor said and didn't mean to say or sermons that gripped you or times where you're reading the Bible and, and God really revealed to you truth that, that shaped a decision. Because here's the thing, God is always remembering us. And as his people, one of the things that kind of builds our faith is to remember him, to remember who he is, what the scriptures teach us about him, and what he's done. And that's going to have a, a, a large effect in shaping who we are as a people. So would you pray with me? God, we're here th this weekend to think about the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ, to remember when we were dead in our trespasses, and you brought life to our beating hearts. Where you gave us new hope. Where you took a future that was bleak, and you gave us hope. Where you rerouted the direction of our lives. We're here, and we are evidence of families that have been restored. Marriages brought back together, the power of forgiveness to change a life, of the ability of words to break things down, and your word incarnated as its testimony and a standing statement that you will not leave us or forsake us, but that you are ever with us. And so God, I pray that even as we look through the story of the church of Philippi, we look back at its founding and draw some implications for our lives now that you would help us to remember that the scriptures speak with authority to all of our life. That we don't find you populating the story of our life, but we find in the scriptures that you have woven our lives into the fabric of the story, that you created the world, put us in it, and then you came to seeking to save the lost. And we find that our stories have significance because you are the larger context in which our lives play out. So we're desperate for you. And if we're going to avoid the sins of our past and, and, and avoid those mistakes and not make the same ones again in the future, if we will break the cycle of our parents' sins for our own children, God, we need you. So would you remind us of your, of your character? And would you remind us of the things that you have done for us so that we would have the faith to walk on into college and adulthood equipped to handle no matter what happens? So God, would you encourage us? Would you make your people strong? so that we can continue to advance the church here in Virginia. God, would you use us? Would you speak to us tonight? In your name we pray, amen. All right, so if you would, turn to the book of Philippians real quickly, because I want us to look at the beginning of the book at Philippi, because I think it's important. You can think of the letter to the church at Philippi from Paul as sort of a thank you letter. Anybody ever written a thank you letter? Let's be real, okay? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to kind of let you see the mess that is my life. And you be honest with me, okay? So I know that there's probably already been some difficult circumstances. You know what I mean? Like, th but when you got here, like, there was already some stress from maybe your youth pastor or your youth leader. Who thinks this is just going to be just, this is Christian community and honesty right here. Who's willing to acknowledge that there? youth pastor, youth leader, there's an adult in your group that, like, they need to write a thank you letter to their spouse right now because, like, when they left, they told you it was a mess, and they came here, and they know when they go home it's about 
to get real, and they're the one kind of doing that midnight feeding, or you, like, were late, and so you made them late. Anybody, like, ready to acknowledge that, like, if there was anyone here who needed to write a thank you letter, that, like, your youth pastor is that person? Or maybe there was a person who got their order wrong, and so, like, they were kind of stressed. Anybody? You don't have to tell us what they did. We don't want to know. Anyone ready to acknowledge that their, their youth leader needs to write a thank you letter? Come on, let me see that hand. Anybody? Anybody willing to admit your, your marriage could benefit from? We got one? All right, you know what I did. This is how thoughtful I am. I got you a thank you letter right here, and I picked out the prettiest one that I could find. So, it, the, unfortunately, I missed this part. There's not really a thank you on the inside, so just a heads up. Like, I, I really want you to, to write that. Otherwise, it's not clear. Uh, who raised their hand? I saw. But you're not an adult. Oh, thank you. Yeah, there you go. You Oh, it's for somebody else. I'm sorry. It's for a guy. That's welcome to my life. Right, Neil. All right, we're going to pray for you at the end of the service. This is sort of Paul's letter to the Church of Philippi. Anybody ever watch the Tonight Show? Thank you cards are kind of coming back. Tonight Show, he, Jimmy Fallon, who hosts the Tonight Show, writes thank you notes on Friday. I thought it would be really helpful for you if we looked at some of the better thank you notes that Jimmy Fallon writes. Are you interested in kind of reviewing them? All right, so if you don't know this, there's a segment on Tonight Show where Jimmy Fallon writes thank you cards because that's how conscientious he is. They're sort of sarcastic, so they fit my preferred style of communication. So if you are unfamiliar with them, they're short, so you've got to pay attention, and they're kind of humorous, but sometimes they're really clever. So if you, like, don't get it immediately, just give it time. It'll marinate, you'll get it, and then you can laugh, but we're just going to keep going because we don't want to wait for the laughter. Are you ready? Jimmy Fallon writes, thank you, peer pressure, for being totally not cool, unless my friends think it's cool, and then it's pretty cool, I, I guess, <laughs> right? Thank you, oatmeal, for looking like I already ate you before I eat you. <laughs> it's healthy, but it's got some presentation issues. <laughs> Thank you, the phrase, the greatest thing since sliced bread, for making me seriously wonder who's in charge of deciding what the greatest thing is. <laughs> this is one of my favorites. Thank you, hors d'oeuvres, for being appetizers that moved to France and got all snooty. <laughs> Thank you, clapping, for being high fives that you get to keep to yourself. <laughs> there you go. All right, how about this one? Last one. Thank you, blowing out candles on a birthday cake, because there's nothing I want to do more than eat a dessert that my friends spit on. Some of you are like, oh, I've never thought about it like that. It's okay. So that's what Paul's doing. Why would Paul need to write Church at Philippi a thank you letter? It's a good question. Here's what happened. Essentially, Paul goes and he gets like thrown in prison, as Paul is wont to do. It kind of happens uh, on a number of occasions, and that's where he writes the letter to the Church of Philippi that we call Philippians. And so the thing is, Paul's stuck there, and as he is in prison, like trying to do ministry, the church at Philippi gathers together a gift that they send to Paul through this person named Epaphroditus. Everybody say Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus. When you get to a word that looks like that, just go with that pronunciation. Save us all like face in, in Sunday school, right? Epaphroditus takes the gift to Paul and ministers to Paul while he's in prison. And Paul is really blessed by that because Paul has a great relationship with the church at Philippi. How good is the relationship with Paul at the church at Philippi? Look at what he writes here in the beginning of the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 1. He says this, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's some of the things that are interesting. Before we look at the story of Philippi, I want you to understand that Paul here does something different because of his relationship with church. First, he doesn't just say that it's him writing. He includes Timothy. Like, what's the big deal, you ask? It's the only time he does that. So normally, Paul writes to the churches, and he writes to them based off of his relationship with the church. 
But here, Paul writes with Timothy because the church at Philippi, they share a special big origin story. And Paul is involved in life with the church, and he is also with making disciples that go with him to make disciples. And so there's this familial bond with the church there. He's their father in the faith. So here he calls Timothy as a testimony to the church for their special relationship. He also refers to them as servants. Normally, Paul calls himself an apostle because if you write harsh things, as Paul also does, it helps to have a title that gives you the authority to say that. You know what I mean? So Paul will write like, oh, you stupid Galatians. Remember, I've seen Jesus and he sent me. You know what I mean? That's a good trump card, so you can write stuff like that. It's why, like, if you're a kid and you talk to your mom the way that your dad has in kind of rare moments, you learn real quickly that that relationship is not the same between you and mom, or, right, or you and dad. You kind of think you're teasing, and you go a little, a little too far. You learn real quickly that the relationship kind of, nope, you don't have the authority to do that. So Paul kind of, he lessens the position that he takes with the church here. It doesn't mean he's not an apostle, right? Apostle is just someone who's seen Jesus and been commissioned by him. But Paul, he calls himself a servant because of the way that he served the church. There's a sweet note to the opening of this letter. He writes to all of them, right, to the church. So this is a letter that we get to read, and it's addressed to people in a situation like us, the church of Philippi. So if you would, turn to Acts chapter 16, because Jordan read for us the first part of the text we're going to look at this evening. Acts chapter 16. Maybe you've gotten a thank you letter, and you'll really appreciate the relationship that Paul gives evidence to in Philippi. I have written one thank you letter in my educational career. I call it a career because it makes me feel better about how long it took. And it was in the seventh grade. There was a teacher. Her name was Miss Nyla. I don't know why that me and my friends thought that we would call her Miss Nyla the goat. There's nothing clever about it. It was just one of the things that you do when you're in middle school, right? And your teacher is, like, just out of college. Like, she's, like, a new kind of person. You, you've seen, like, older teachers. This is the first, like, young teacher I'd ever had. So I actually got to class before she did for the class that I had with her in language arts. And there were these things called projectors. You guys know what I'm talking about with projectors? And there were some, some of your school technology and it really needs to improve. And you could project things from transparencies that your teacher could write on onto the wall. And so a lot of teachers would build their lesson plans off them. And they were kind of erasable markers. Well, like... I'm a middle school boy. I don't think about consequences. So I got to class before anybody else did. So I got in this habit of leaving Miss Nyla like thank you notes slash encouraging quotes that I found on the internet. And so I would really like research them. And some of them were just comical. Some of them were subtly like condescending. Some of them were just like my favorite quote from like He-Man or you know, like Johnny, New Adventures of Johnny Quest, TV shows that I, I liked. So I, I got in the habit, and then she called my parents, and I got out of the habit. But if you've ever gotten a thank you note, you know how powerful they can be, right? Why is it good to get a note thanking you? Because it means somebody noticed you, right? It means somebody has observed what you did sacrificially or what you offered or what you were willing to do, and so they're taking a moment to be personal with you. Right? This is like beyond a text. Someone sat down with a pen and a paper, and they wrote it out to you. It's sort of like when I met my wife, I don't know what happened. But I, I mean, my testimony, this is not her testimony, this is my testimony. I would say I fell in love with her immediately. And one of the ways that that naturally just kind of worked itself out, I was 29, so it was like, you know, I'd kind of, I hadn't dated a lot, but I'd honestly like knew kind of what I was looking for. And so when I saw her, we were kind of working camp together because love happens at camp, but for adults, not youth. And <laughs> we were doing ministry together, and there was just a bond that kind of happened. And I knew by the end of the week that, like, this sounds crazy. I didn't tell her this, right? So don't use this as a, a how-to guide. I, I, I was like, I love this, wom this woman, and I'm going to marry her. 
So to give you a picture of how that worked, we met in June. We start, I finally convinced her to date me at the end of October. We were engaged by March, married by August. So we've been married a, like a couple months before we had like a one-year dating anniversary. And that's purpose, you know what I mean? Like, and one of the things that happened is we were dating. We always dated long distance, unfortunately. I was in Raleigh-Durham. She was in St. Louis. So I got in the habit of writing her. And one of the ways that just like that I knew I needed to express my affection for my wife was through writing, and I, I decided to go like old school, you know, like handwritten. To this date, at this point, I've written over 120 pages of letters. I want my kids to be able to look back at our mail and see how much I love their mom and what that love looked like as it like grew and the different ways that that kind of was expressed and the things that we went through so that when I'm dead, they can look back and appreciate the work that God did. So in the letter Philippians, we're going to now look at the backstory. So we're going to get a, a sense of what God was doing in the life of Paul, Timothy, and Silas in the same way. Right? And I want you to appreciate what God's doing. In it. And I want this to bring to your mind moments where God was, was working in your life, or God ministered to you, or sent people into your life to care for you, to look out for you. Okay, so look in Acts chapter 16 real quickly. And they went, this is Paul and Timothy and Silas, through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they'd come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went into Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately, Luke writes, We sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So here we have the story of how Paul and Timothy and Silas are called by the Spirit to go, right? This is a great example of Matthew 28, the Great Commission, right, where Jesus says, all authority has been given to me, heaven and earth. And so he sends out the disciples to go, and as you are going, make disciples, he tells them. This is a great example of that. As Paul and Timothy and Silas are going, they are making disciples, and then there's a moment where God calls them from somewhere to somewhere else. But look at this again, because there's part of this verse that should trouble us. Look at verse 6 again. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia. And why did they do that? Because they had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. I remember being next to a friend of mine, Korean guy in church when this was read. And I'll never forget his reaction. I don't know if it was the first time he had read Acts 16 or just the first time that the notion hit him that the gospel had not been allowed by the Spirit of God to go east. And just think about that. From his perspective, here he reads that that God literally stopped Paul from going to take the gospel to his people, leaving them to grow up in darkness for thousands of years so that the gospel could go back west. That's, what do we do with that? Right? That God would say no to taking the gospel but for Paul and Timothy and Silas to the east. Think about all the things that you've read about the church and as it's expanding here, as it's growing here, as they're experiencing the presence of God with them as they go and, and thousands of people are coming to faith in Christ and there's a, amazing things happening. Maybe you can relate more to this part where there's a whole group of peoples who are denied access by the Spirit of God and that troubles you. Maybe you feel like you're watching other families like stay together and enjoy the benefit of a mom and dad in a home and, and you're thinking like where is God's blessing in my family's life or you maybe didn't get into the college that you wanted to get into and so as you watch friends get acceptance letters you're, you're thinking you know what happened in my future that God would cut it off like this 
Maybe you just didn't grow up in a home that got to experience like parents discipling their children. And so by the time that you heard the gospel, you had already had to deal with things that you shouldn't have had to like encounter. No one had been there to protect you from bad decisions and give you guidance into how to successfully navigate like being a student. Things like this happen, right? So when we read them in the Bible, here's one of the things that like, I've ever grown more confident of, that one of the things that we need to do is not have an immediate reaction because that can be troubling. We take a step back, and, and let's just remember what book we're reading. We're, we're reading the book of Acts, right? So how do we answer this? I'm not, I'm not saying I have a great answer. I'll offer one, but sometimes all I can offer is I don't know. But we look in, in this text, and one of the things that we need to do is take a step back and look at the larger context of the book of Acts. And what is God doing, right? Let's ask that question. God is taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, and he's committed to that. So we, we do need to keep in mind that God came to seek and to save the lost. He came in Jesus, God incarnate in the flesh, because we were unable to work our way back up to God. And so he came to us. That's the missionary heart of God. That's you always on his mind, that you would be worth pursuing. So when you read this, one of the things you can think is, okay, God didn't allow them to go to the east. And that's true for Paul and Silas and Timothy, but that doesn't mean that God didn't have a heart for the people in the east. Because the church was not just about a certain group of like super varsity Christians who were going out. It's about the work that God's doing in everyday believers and how the Spirit of God is working in the lives of these countless people and, and the growth of the church through that. So here's the question that we can ask. What about us? Because the call to go and make disciples and to take the gospel to the ends of the earth isn't just something Paul gave to the early church. He gave it to us. And maybe... Maybe God is calling you to give a word of testimony. Or maybe you can think of a friend who needs to hear the gospel and, and you're the only Christian that they know. Maybe you're here this weekend so you can be reminded that the Great Commission stands over you. It's a command to, to go and make disciples. That as we live life, that we're supposed to be doing that in a way that, that people are able to hear the good news of Jesus and believe and and confess Jesus as their Lord and Savior for the forgiveness of their sins and experience new life in Jesus Christ. When's the last time that you extended that invitation? Because if we don't recoil from that as much as we recoil from a sentence like the Holy Spirit was forbidding them to go, then we've already condemned ourselves. But here is the good news. That God's at work in the world. And he's using everyday people like you and me to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. So here's the only thing that God asks us to do, to be willing to submit to the work of the Spirit in our life. So let me ask that question as a follow-up. Are you willing to embrace God's call on your life this weekend? Because here's what I want tonight for you to think about and do. I want you to, to say to God that you are willing to be sensitive to how he leads this weekend. I want you to offer to God the blank check of your life to say, God, as you move in my life, as you bring friends to my mind or relatives or neighbors or kids that I know aren't connected at school to a group of friends or new people who visited your church that aren't connected vitally to your church or your youth group, I want you to be willing to follow the Spirit's leading in your life. Because one of the things we're going to see is how, how God uses Paul's sensitivity to the Spirit of God to tap into the work that God's doing in Philippi and to birth the church. And here's the, the encouraging thing for all of us. It doesn't matter if you're here and you're in middle school and you're like, look, I'm just trying to like figure out how not to run into the kids who are like double my size, right? In ninth grade, I was like five foot, 100 pounds, Right? As little. I, I don't know if you noticed, I'm not exactly grown now, but I know what it's like to be like looked at and 
kind of moved to the side, whether that means physically put in a locker or just not, not like have much expected of you, right? Maybe you're here this weekend and, and you're thinking like, look, like, I'm, I'm just figuring out how to read out loud. Like, I, I don't have much to offer if, if someone wants to give me a testimony. I don't know how to share the gospel. Here's what we do read in the book of Acts, that willing believers are used by the Spirit of God powerfully. We don't read about, like, the super Christians who had everything together before they were used by God. So here's all God wants from you. He wants you to be willing. He wants you to be able to trust that his work in you does not rest on your ability, but on his ability to do work through you and despite you. So what would God have you do? Where would God have you go? Where would God take your youth group? What would he do with us in this room if we were willing to be used by God and sensitive to his spirit? The possibilities are endless. And not because I can see you and I see that you got a lot going on or that you're like attractive enough to like be influential or that I saw like a lot of people doing good push-ups and so I'm confident in your like physical ability or because like I, I saw your report cards because your youth leaders brought them to me. I mean like nothing like that. I'm confident that God can do a great work not because I'm confident in you as special as you all are. I'm confident because God is always at work in the world, and when we tap into what he's doing already, we get to see amazing things happen. It's how Jesus could look the disciples in the eye and say, you will do greater works than these and not be lying. So what would God do if we were willing to allow him to use us? I remember there was a moment in my life where I really I got convicted about the same things, right? And I always had a reason, like I was too busy or I was too engaged elsewhere or I just wasn't coming into contact with that many believers. And someone challenged me to share the gospel with at least one person a week. And so I happened to be flying a lot at the time, and flying is good for sleeping. So I kind of tended to sleep on airplanes, not talk to people, because talking to people on airplanes is like the worst thing in the world that you can do, right? I mean, it's like, because you don't know if the person's going to shut up, you know what I mean? Like, you don't know if that means that they're going to feel comfortable, like, taking the armrest and then taking more. So this was risky. I, mean, I want you to appreciate the riskiness that that involved in my life. But I decided, you know, like, I do need to be sensitive to what God's doing. So I prayed. I remember praying on a Friday morning. I was getting ready to fly. Like, God, I, give me an opportunity today to share the gospel. And I'll take it. I, so I started looking for it, right, anticipating it. And I was on the flight, and it's southwest, so, like, you get to kind of sit wherever you want. And I happen to have an early, like, boarding number, so I got on the plane. And I don't know if I was, like, over-eager. Like, you know what I mean? Like, if, if someone is, like, making a lot of eye contact on an airplane, like, that's someone that you generally want to avoid. So maybe it was that. I was over-eager, and so people were, like, mm -mm, not sitting next to him or, like, my son's handsome, but I'm, like, found wanting in that category. And so, like, people thought, I'd rather sit next to someone who is not going to offend my sensibilities. And so they, like, bypassed me. But finally, like, most of the other seats were filled. And I saw this old man. He's, like, 80. And he was dressed like, like he had style. You know what I mean? Like, he's wearing a full suit with a sweater and a tie. And he had a fedora and not, like, ironically, like he had it because he probably had it for a long enough time that they'd come back into style. And I'm like, dude, I got a window seat with your name on it. So he comes down the aisle, he sees the window seat, and he takes the middle seat, which should have kind of tipped me off that this is unusual, right? So I decided, like, this is it. This is my opportunity. I'm sure I was kind of like giving myself a, a pep talk, because that's what you do when you're nervous, which probably made, it, made him like a lot less sure about his seating choice. But I got to, over the next hour, share the gospel with him. And he had read the book of John recently. Go figure, right? Because when we're willing to be used by God, God tends to already be at work. And he's bringing us to the thing that he's already doing. And that's a great thing for us because it means there's no pressure. So I, I was like, okay. So we start talking about the gospel. And I noticed this really unusual thing that, that we were talking pretty quickly because he knew a lot about John and so we're getting into the Bible which is always good but he has this habit of like spitting when he talked and I don't mean like he didn't have like enough 
body moisture, so there was like a little spit that would build up on his lips that would kind of like come out after a little while. I don't mean like that. I mean every single time he opened his mouth, he gleeked. <laughs> every single time. And you remember where he's sitting, right? Sitting right next to me, on my left. So as he spoke, he spit my direction. I'm not being dramatic here. This was that awful. And because of, I guess, the way that I was sitting forward in my seat and he was leaning back, he, he happened to be gleeking. I, like, where am I? I need to look at the camera. So help me do that, right? Like, gleeking, am I looking at Right about here on my thigh. And I remember having the thought as I was sharing the gospel, which sort of means I didn't do a good job, right? Because there were other things on my mind at the time. But, like, I remember thinking, like, I'm glad he's spitting lower on my leg because if it was higher, I would be really worried about what people might think because I was wearing khakis. <laughs> you can imagine what happened. Remember, we were talking fast, and it was an hour, and slowly, like, I just had to bite the bullet because there came a moment where I felt the spit puddle on my leg growing, and it connected to my hip. I never said when we connect to the work that God's doing, it will always be easy. And I knew as soon as I stood up that I would look like at 24 years old, I had peed myself because I couldn't control my bladder on a Southwest flight that was only an hour long. <laughs> but I persevered. My dad picked me up at the airport, worried, until I explained what happened, and he was really relieved. Interestingly enough, it looked like I had the same emotion. So <laughs> when we tap into the work that God's doing, we get to experience the Spirit's presence. And that's what comforted me through my suffering that morning. I got to be in correspondence with the guy. We kept up for about three months afterwards. And the guy never believed, but I got the opportunity to share with him and his family because of that. It's amazing what God is doing when we are willing to be obedient. Not only that, but did you know that there are missionaries that have this story or testimony that they wanted to go to one place, but as God would have it, he sent them somewhere else, often where they were least qualified or interested in going? Why? Because when we are willing to be obedient to the Spirit of God, he is already at work, and we get to tap into that, and he does it in a way that we get to enjoy his presence and Rejoice in the glory of the Lord. And it, it, and it happens to be in a way that we can't take credit for it. Not that we would want to. But did you know that William Carey, who went to India and served on the continent for 28 years and lost two wives, that he would serve there for eight years before he saw his first convert, and then thousands and hundreds of thousands of people would come to faith in Christ because of the work of one missionary who didn't even want to go to India. Or the story of Adoniram Judson, who went to China, even though he wanted to go to South America because the climate was more appealing to him. Or the story of Lottie Moon, who didn't want to go to China because she thought their culture was uncivilized. But God would call her there and give her a heart for those people, and then they would literally build a day where we give to missions because of her example of loving the people. So God can do a great work. Now let's really quickly look through these stories. Because what God does in the life of Paul, he can do today. All right, so I want you to think about these three stories as we look at them. And then we're going to draw a couple conclusions before we wrap up. Setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace. Isn't that great? And the following day, we went to Neapolis. And from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony in and Luke says, we remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we, were, where we supposed that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the woman who had come together there. And one who heard from us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. And the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, her whole household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she prevailed upon us. 
So look what happens immediately as they get to the city. Paul, who had a habit of going to the synagogue, instead goes outside the city to the place of prayer, notices women there praying. They're not praying to the God of the scriptures that he knows in the person of Jesus Christ. They're just praying. And Paul notices these women who were generally a marginalized people. Because in the ancient world, women weren't even allowed to give testimony in court because their word wasn't reputable enough. Women weren't honest then. I'm not saying you aren't now. I would call you into court if I were a lawyer and we were in court. I, I would absolutely accept your testimony. But Paul notices an opportunity and a sensitivity to the work that God's doing means that not only is this woman named Lydia who sells purple things like this shirt, she comes to faith in Christ, then her whole house also. So what does that mean for you and me when we are open to the work that God's doing, that God provides opportunities for us to share the gospel? And when we do that, we're tapping into the work that he's already doing. So here's the question. What might God already have done if you were willing to be used by him? What in your life might God be at work in that you're afraid that he is absent from if you were just willing to be submissive to his spirit's leading? In the story of Lydia, we see that God is at work to prepare great things for the people who are willing to be used by them. The church has started in Europe in this story because Paul notices people. Are you a noticer of people? Are you able to look at people and see the human side of them? I don't mean that the guy at the grocery store who was rude to you, that you see him as an angry person that you have a right to be loud with. I mean, are you aware that God might be doing a work in his life to humble him, and therefore he needs not your harsh word, but a soft one? Are you able to see that the guy who lists, lifts obsessively and who seems to only have confidence socially because of his accomplishments might need a God more stable than his own achievements? And to know that you don't have to justify yourself before him, but you get to rather minister to him, and he's going to be abrasive and probably demean you. But when the love of Christ compels us, we are able to love in a way that Jesus loved. Are you a noticer of people? Do you notice the shy, quiet kid in your group who tends to deflect all serious questions because he's afraid that if he or she begins to unearth what's really happening in their life, that they won't be able to keep it under wraps or keep it in control any longer? Will you take a moment to just sit with them? I hope that I get to have a daughter next. I love my son, but he prefers my wife. And I'm hoping that if we have a daughter, that she will be like daddy's girl. Here's one of the things I know from working with students, and this is what I, I hope for you, that I hope that we're able to be in a place where I get to like buy my daughter fancy things. Fancy means different for me than it does for my wife because she's classy and I'm not. But I hope that I'm able to do that. I hope I'm in a position to do that because I know my wife remembers her 16th birthday when her dad brought home like a blue box. When she told me that story, I, I was like, what's significant about what was in the blue box? And she's like, it was Tiffany blue. I'm like, that's great. I don't know what that color is. Can you get to what's inside the box? But she, she gave the testimony in that moment that I knew I was worth waiting for, or I knew I deserved good things, not because of something I had done, but because that's how God provides for his people. Not like miserly, as if he's the Grinch, but generously, because that's who God is. And I was able to wait because I saw a dad who like, communicated that I was worth his time, his attention, and a few nice things. I'm not saying your dad doesn't love you. If he can't give you nice things, you need to understand what it is that your dad gives and how he's trying to communicate that he loves you and, and, and understand that that's going to look different for different dads. But here's what I want to communicate to the daughter that I have because I don't ever want her to get married or to kiss a boy or anything. I, I want her to know that she has worth before her creator because he has endowed her with his image. And sometimes like women just need to be reminded of that. And they need to be told. And gentlemen need to be appreciated for the work that they're trying to do, even if like, 
they're working in a way that isn't really that helpful. You know what I mean? Like when I try to set the table, Val always appreciates that when I clean the bathroom by dumping bleach in the tub, that like I'm trying to help in that moment. You think I'm joking, probably, but welcome to my wife's world. Are you a noticer of people? Would that be your church's testimony? The community understands that you're able to see them as they are. Really quickly then, the last two stories are this slave girl that chases Paul and and Timothy and Silas, and this is what she yells. These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. Seems like a good advertisement if you're trying to share the gospel with people, right? And this is one of those verses that really speaks to me. Paul became greatly annoyed with her and turned to the Spirit and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. And her owners get so mad, the people who who gained a profit because of what she was able to divine about the future through a demonic spirit. Her owners get mad at Paul and Silas and put them in prison because they've lost their profits. Here's one of the things that we see about Paul's willingness to be sensitive to the Spirit's work in the story of the slave girl. We are aware that there is a spiritual battle at work in everyone with whom we share the gospel. So regardless of whether her life looks perfect because she drives the right car and wears the right clothes and has the right friends, it doesn't mean that at home things are chaotic and so she does a lot of work to keep it looking right from an appearance sake. That there are spiritual battles happening all around us so that the guy who acts up to get attention might not get any when he gets home. Or the kid who stuffs his face and always tries to food might be doing that because not just because he like likes shock tarts and Mountain Dew but because at home he doesn't get extra things like that so when we tap into the work that Christ is doing we are gaining a sensitivity for his people that allows us to minister to them as individuals and here's the thing that we know about the work of God you ready for this you want to write something down this is about all I got for you tonight that God's work in us is personal And it's intimate, but it's never private. God's work in us is personal. It's individual. It's with you and what's going on in your life and about him bringing life from the death and helping you to walk in good works and to grow in faith. It's personal. It's for you. It's intimate. God knows you. He knows what you need, and he'll heal the wounds that you have. And all our wounds are individual. But it's never private. God's work in Moses was on behalf of the people of Israel. His formation of Abraham as a father to many nations was so that we as outsiders would be brought into the covenant that God made with people at Sinai. So God's work in you, friends, is for other people to benefit and enjoy the ministry of. And here's why that's important. You ready? Because I only have a certain number of experiences, and they aren't enough to reach the world for Jesus. So we need each other because we all bring something different to the table. We can all give a word of testimony about something that someone else is out there struggling with, which requires a certain vulnerability between us. And we have to be able to notice these things as we walk through the city, as we encounter people at grocery stores and school hallways and on sports fields. We have to be sensitive to the Spirit's work. And lastly, before we finish and look at this Philippian jailer, right, Paul and Silas get thrown in prison because of the ministry that they do, meaning, hey, here's the thing that we need to pay attention to, that the work of Christ has consequences for our lives. But it's a price that Jesus deemed worth paying, and so he's called us to be worth it too. So we don't read about just, like, happy things happening. We read about costly things happening being given up for the sake of the good of people. So here's an interesting thing, though. When they're in prison, you know what they're doing? They're praying and singing hymns to God and making the prisoners listen to them. (laughs) So they're witnessing even in prison. They've been beaten and thrown in jail, and Paul and Silas are praying, which means that no matter what you're dealing with right now, you ready? no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what chaos is swirling, no matter what anxieties 
are creeping in on your mind, no matter what responsibilities are weighing you down, no matter what occasions in the future have you concerned or what job opportunities you aren't sure are coming or financial assistance that you desperately need isn't on the horizon. Here's the thing that we know about God, that he uses all of those situations in our life if we're willing for, for, to go through them and to endure them, then God can bring good out of all of it. So here, Paul and Silas, humbled, beaten, have an opportunity to, to lead a man and his whole family to Christ because they don't shut down. They don't walk away from God because they were after the gifts of God, not God himself. So what about you? Is that, would that be your testimony this morning? Are you here as sort of a last-ditch effort to hear from God and, and just kind of done with the whole thing? If you don't hear from him, then here's, I want you to hear this word this evening. That God knows exactly where you are and exactly what you feel and exactly what's going on. And he's going to bring good from it. The powerful thing about the story with the Philippian jailer is at the end of the whole story, we find out that they are released from prison and then they are told to leave the city. And here's what happens in verse 40. So they went out of the prison and they stopped by to visit Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because the church in Philippi at this point should only be Lydia, a girl who had been demon-possessed, who's presumably unemployed, and a Philippian jailer in his, his household. But the Philippian jailer isn't present at Lydia's house, that is the basis of the church, but there are already people who have been won to Christ because of the work that Paul did in the life of Lydia and the slave girl or the demon-possessed girl, and Paul refers to them here. He says that they encouraged the brothers and sisters. So here's what we also know that when we're willing to share the gospel, God's at work to bring s fruit in places where we wouldn't expect to find it. And that fruit multiplies. So think about your life. How did you come to faith in Christ? Chances are that it was because someone took a time to share with you the gospel, and you believed. And if you've won people to Christ, their fruit's bearing fruit exponentially increasing. What would happen if we all understood the responsibility to go and make disciples? The band's going to come back out, and they're going to sing for us. They're going to lead us to sing and to celebrate all the good that God has done in our life. As we reflect back on the victory that God's brought us, the relief that God has helped us find, the hope that he has secured for us in heaven. And, and we're going to sing, but first I'm going to pray, and I want you to pray with me. And here's how we're going to kind of roll through this invitation tonight. First, I'm going to pray, and I want you to pray with me as we just ask that God would make us sensitive this weekend, just this weekend. Let's start small and reasonable, and let's ask that we would be open to the Spirit's word to us through the scriptures, in community, and that we would be waiting for opportunities to, to give a word of testimony. Or maybe for you it's as simple as identifying yourself as a Christian to your family and friends. Maybe it's reaching out to someone that you think is, is hurting or doesn't have someone to talk to and, and you've kind of dealt with what you think might be going on in their life and it's just you being willing to say, like, what's going on in your life? And don't give me like the, the fine answer. I want us to pray that God would make us sensitive so that at the end of even just this weekend, we would be able to share stories of forgiveness, reconciliation, joy in sorrow because of the work that God is doing. And then more than that, I want us to also be praying together as a church because, look, if we're going to grow in our faith and if we're going to continue to be encouraged and strengthened and unified around the gospel of Jesus Christ so that we don't get tripped up on the, over the way each other talk or over the kind of clothes we wear or what our church does and doesn't do, if we're going to be finding joy in his people with whom we gather weekly, then here's one of the things we need to do. We need to pray together. 
Because maybe you're here with some people in your youth group and, and you aren't cool with the way that they've treated you or you didn't find that they were as welcoming to you as they have been to other people who've come since you've been there. Or maybe your group just isn't unified because you're kind of fractured into groups. Maybe your group's large and it has that problem just because of the numbers or it's small and it still has the same issue. I'm going to ask, this is the way it's going to work. First, we're going to pray, right? We're going to ask that God make us sensitive individually because his work in us is personal and intimate but not private. And then the band's going to sing and they're going to like, we're going to celebrate what God has done in our life and the victories that he's won because we're going to bring our past into the present so that it shapes our future. And then you're going to be dismissed, but you're going to be asked to pray as a group before you leave. So that after we sing and, and celebrate the work of God, because his work is good. When I think about what God gave to me, I finally see what Adam saw when he looked at Eve. Because good doesn't mean like it's somewhere between great and horrible. Good means this is what you made exactly for me. And so that's what we're going to celebrate, the good things that God has done. So after we sing, then they can come up and make some announcements, but before you're dismissed, before you leave, before you go back to your churches or your homes, I want you to pray together. If you're a small group, that's going to be easier for you. You don't have to pray in here. You can kind of go out to your vehicles. You can go out in the lobby. You can kind of go up to the second floor, maybe. I, I can't speak with authority on that, so... Uh, wait for direction at the end of the service, but maybe you're a large group and you need to break down into smaller groups. So your youth pastor will give you instruction about kind of how he wants to do prayer or how your leaders want to do prayer. But here's what I'm going to ask, that you guys would pray together because when we pray for each other, it's hard to be mad at each other. It's hard to like let little petty things get in the way of what God might do in us when we hear each other pray for one another. And when we hear someone asking for God to do good things for us, we remember that maybe they don't hate us quite as much as we think they did because they didn't save us a seat. Right? We want to be gracious people who see the best in each other because of who we see is Christ at work in us.